Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Aligned Attraction. I am jazzed to be speaking with Ari Winters today, and I'm going to tell you all about them and why we're having this conversation. And I'll just share some context that upon connecting for the first time, I was so fascinated about the work that you lead in the world and the impact that it has had. So today we're going to be talking about something called authentic relating and the relating languages. And Ari will explain what all of this is, but let me just first introduce them. Um, Ari Winters is a professional facilitator and creator of the relating languages. And growing up, they were drawn to the complexities of human interaction, acting as a bridge between different social circles and communities. And this sparked their fascination with facilitating discussions and fostering connections between people from diverse backgrounds. And they've worked with organizations such as Google, Dell, Mind Valley, with Rebel Wilson, Kellogg, the National Weather Service all teaching communication and leadership skills. Amazing. Ari, I am so happy to have you here and to receive and be a part of this wisdom that you're embodying the world. Thanks, Lee. I'm so happy to be here today. Amazing. Yay. All right. So let's just start with the, I I was going to say the basics. I don't know that this is actually basic at all, but what is authentic relating and what are the relating languages? Cool. Um, I'm going to say first that I'm appearing under a pseudonym. So Ari Winters is not my real name. It's a name that's used by all the members of my team. So we can all appear publicly to represent the system. So sometimes I'm going to give details where people are like, isn't that so-and-so? And And I'll be like, yes, secretly. Um, So authentic relating um, is a form of, of connecting that is... You could say it's more authentic. I have feelings about the word authentic. I think anything we're doing at any time is authentic to some part of ourselves. But authentic relating is like, let me look a little bit deeper. Let me see what is more true. Let me communicate from that place. And oftentimes it involves a lot of empathy, listening in the relating piece of it as well um, in order to share ourselves fully. Something I noticed after teaching in that field for about 10 years and founding multiple communities and creating some of the source manuals for it is... The practices that we were doing, which we called authentic relating games, were encouraging a certain type of communication that when people heard it from the outside, they felt like it was kind of exclusive. Like there was a lot of long eye contact. There was a lot of curiosity, reflecting back what you heard, holding space, making space, like even those words. We had terms for things that not everybody else did. And what it meant was slowing down and being with the other person. But then My students would try to take this back to their parents or their colleagues um, or their friends. They'd get told, like, what are you doing? Like, that's super weird. (laughs) What is this strange language you're speaking? And after a while, um, especially when I, I joined my now husband's community, who also interacted very, very differently, I started just getting curious, like, if what I want is actually to make communication better, And my overall goal is decreasing suffering. Um, I think a lot of suffering comes from just bad communication. Um, I was like, if that's my goal, I can't just be teaching a practice that's exclusive to people that are, that, that are finding it right. It's like, got to go out to people that are interacting very differently, which is the mainstream. So I started looking into, I and my team started looking into, um, what are some of the the underlying norms of communication, of the ways that people talk with each other and what was different about these different communities that each of us were in. And what we found, we distill into something that we call the relating languages. Um, I can go on about those if you want, but I want to pause. Please. Yeah, please. So the idea is that in a lot of conscious community, um, and I'm using that in quotes because that's a big field um, and, people are in and out of many different communities. So um, in a lot of conscious community, the languages that we use are more what I'd call receptive. Um, so they're about taking in information. Um, and the the two languages, there's four languages total, the two under that um, bracket are questioning and observing. So in observing, I'm just, I'm, I'm receptive, right? I'm taking in I am maybe reflecting back what I hear or sharing present moment impact, but I'm not adding new information to the conversation. 
which is a super good language if you want to make space for someone else to open up, for instance. Like if you have someone who's a little bit more shy, using observing is amazing. If you want to clarify and make sure you've got something right, if you want to see wider trends, like if you're in a meeting and you're going, I don't, there, there's something happening here, there's an elephant in the room, but I don't know what it is, go observing. Watch what's going on first. Um, but it can also be confusing, like if you're in observing a lot and someone else asks you a question, you take a long time to think about it and respond, or you're more comfortable with silence than other people are, or you don't give people, they feel like you're not giving them a straight answer, or you're reflecting when they want to hear your point of view. These are all potential downsides of, of observing. Um, and kind of sidebar, people don't just speak one language. We all have kind of a center of gravity of which ones we prefer and when, but we have the capacity to use all of them, which is currently my work is like, what's the developmental capacity to learn and use these languages in places that they're really good. Um, so questioning is the other receptive language, and this one's more interactive. It's about receiving information, but you still may be like, you're engaging with the conversation. Like, um, like when you're asking me questions, that's totally questioning language. And some people are quick about this. Like they love the back and forth of it. And other people will ask a question and then like do more listening. Um, best tool for sure for getting information from most people, but questioning can also be a power move, which is something we don't usually look at. It's controlling the direction and pace of a conversation. And other people, this is where sometimes we get the accusation of being too intrusive, um, is oftentimes if the speed and the type of questioning are not aligned to what the other person is willing to share. It can right. almost be a form of invulnerability. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so those are the two receptive ones, questioning and observing. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. And then there are two expressive ones. And that's where people are willing to share information without being asked. Okay. Got it. So, so the yeah, first I've heard of those. Yeah. So they've got cool inter interactions too that I'll talk about. But the first one is storytelling. Um, and this could also be called informing. We're still deciding which name is best, but it's giving information, um, usually at length, describing something, communicating an idea, talking about how you are, telling about an experience you had. It can be facts or it can be personal. Um, it's what I'm doing right now. And storytelling... Um, the interesting thing about this, actually, I was doing some research on this recently, and most people are like, if you talk too long, then other people are going to lose attention, right? Or like, you're going to lose social capital in some way. The research that I was reading actually shows that you can talk for like pretty much as long as you want, and your status only increases. Like people who talk longer are considered to be better leaders, more interesting, like um, more confident, whatever it is. I don't think this goes for all the time. But I was really curious reading that. I do think that controlling the pace of a conversation in storytelling and taking up space is often considered a high status move. But we also all know that there are some situations or some relationships in which it becomes problematic. Like, for instance, if you're intimate partners with somebody that always takes up all the conversational space, it can be really hard to know how to interact. People who storytell a lot sometimes end up getting ghosted because others don't know how to break into the conversation. And they don't even necessarily know why, because a lot of the time it is a socially acceptable move. Um, people with high levels of autism also will sometimes info dump, which can be another difficult thing. Um, so plus side of storytelling, you get information across, you can reveal your motivations, which is a great conflict tool. Like if somebody's like, you're kind of stuck to a viewpoint and then you stop and you say, actually, okay, this is why I care about this. That's another form of storytelling. Um, really great for teaching and downside can take over a bunch of space, can be disempowering to others or can kind of run away with you if you're an external processor. Um, awesome. And, yeah. The last one is directing. And this one was the hardest for us to find. I went through so many different, uh, like testing so many different languages before I realized that directing felt like what was most in this space because it's a fairly rare one that we use, especially in American culture. It's a little more common in other cultures I've seen, like Germany, for instance. Um, but we, if we use it, we tend to do it in a very background way. Like, would you like, or how would you feel about, or are you open to? Like, those are all actually directions. 
or requests, they're oriented towards action. Um, they're asking somebody else to do or participate in something. Um, if you say, hey, you know, would you mind if I, uh, you know, took five minutes longer to come on the podcast, whatever it is, like that is actually falls into the area of directing. But culturally, it's a thing that we're like kind of taught not to do. So, and you see issues with this all over. Like if you're in a meeting, for instance, and you get asked to do something by a manager, but it's not fully clear what you're being asked to do, because especially if you're a woman, like you're not allowed to ask outright. So you're like, hey, how would you feel about, um, you know, getting this to me by Friday? And the other person is like, oh, that sounds like a question. I don't want to get it to you by Friday when actually it's a direction. Um, you're making a request. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the main. And I think there's a lot of potency for learning how to use any of these languages well, like making a clear request and then using storytelling to explain why you want it and then asking how the other person feels and then observing what their reaction is um, or like engaging them by telling a story about why something is important to you and then asking them is, you know, what is important to you? Like is a really beautiful way of starting a conversation. There's, we can combine these. And I think one of the things, or sorry, not, I think, one of the things I've loved doing recently is just test, like testing them and seeing what works on which people, like which people want a story to, or like some information to engage them before I ask questions. What other people just really want to talk and like the curiosity who likes really clear boundaries um, and who would rather have them like a little bit softer, or have me like witness the way they are before I come in. So it's, it's okay. really like exploration. That's beautiful. So now I know that everyone's wondering, especially in the context of romantic relationship, and it, this goes for all relationships, but how do you, what is your personal way to sense how someone would either prefer you show up or what style works best for them? So when you're in an interaction, you're like, well, I can sense that they would really like me to ask a question or they would love to hear a story. And then this is what creates intimacy and an authentic bond between us. What is your way to determine that? Honestly, I just test them. I'll try uh -huh. each of them and I'll try them in different situations and see. Um, and it's not just, we have languages we use in a way when we're speaking and when we're listening. So some people, and, and this is why it's fun to try, like you might be on a date and the person is just talking, talking, talking at length, right? You can respond from any of the relating languages. You could break in and be like, that reminds me of a time that I, and then you start telling a story and then they break it. And you might find that it actually gets really dynamic. Like, oh, they like it when I story tell back. Or it might be that they shut down. They're like, I don't like being interrupted, right? So then you're like, okay, this is somebody who, when they story tell may want me to respond with a different language. Right. So then when they're storytelling, you try breaking in and asking a question. Maybe they like go on a different direction and take that question and then you can keep asking and coming in and then like it becomes engaging. Maybe you ask the question and they get kind of offended. And they're like, that was too vulnerable or I didn't want to be interrupted, um, which is a thing. Some story, some people that are storytelling are cool being interrupted and other time other people take it as disrespect or it stops their flow. Some people will take it as disrespect only if it's you sharing something about yourself. Others will take it if it's questions too, right? So, um, or maybe you're somebody who is actually just like really wants to take in the information and you're cool going and observing. And then you might even be testing a hypothesis. How long does this person talk if I'm just observing? If I'm just kind of saying, mm-hmm, or like, oh, that sounds interesting, or like doing the little kind of movements. It might be that somebody just needs to get their story out or get out the information and then they'll pause and ask you a question. Um, there's cool, gosh, there was some um, some other data I was reading recently that uh, doctors often stop patients after like a certain amount of talking. It's something like 15 seconds of talking. But if if they actually let patients continue what they were saying, they, the patients would only go like 22 seconds. It was like seven mm -hmm. seconds more of describing something. So it's fascinating. Like a lot of people that we think will talk forever actually just want to get an idea across and they'll stop when they've gotten it across. And you don't know unless you go into observing enough. Um, right. Or maybe you try directing and you say, hey, 
I want to stop you for a moment. Um, I'd really like to tell you something about myself. Would you be open to asking me some questions? And maybe they respond great to that. Maybe no one's ever said that to them before. So it's really a trial and error and you can, it just opens up a field of possibility that we'd often don't think is there because we think our only options are listen or walk away. Right. Now that in my mind, what opens up is how do you negotiate that in a relational context? So anyone who's listening to this now has this understanding of these four different relating languages, and then they're going back, they're bringing it to their relationship. They're observing to see, you know, what their partner or the person they're on the date with, what their relating languages are. Mm -hmm. How do you negotiate that in a relational space? And is it, is it in your experience, has it been a very clear conversation? Because I, I imagine now that, you know, we all have our desires in relationships. So let me just go back to the original question. How do you negotiate this? Well, as I'm sure you know, it's it's more complicated than saying it once and having them change. Yeah, um, yeah. I find that the best way I can negotiate changes like this are, uh, and this is the way I do it with my partner, is like outside of the trigger moment. Like say um, he interrupts me when I'm talking about something and makes like a cutting observation. Uh, I think this actually happened recently where he, uh, I was talking on an interview um, and I paused and he said, well, that was a lot. And then he answered the question and I was like, ouch. Um, Cause it was an observation. It was a lot and it felt like a put down. Right. So in that moment, I didn't say anything. I just kind of tracked how I was feeling. I kept on with what was being asked with the interview, which was for us to storytell and not to process with each other. And then afterwards I said, Hey, can I share something with you? Which is a request, a direction actually. Um, and he said, yes. And I was like, there was this moment um, that we had on the interview where you said that was a lot. Do you remember that? Um, so I'm basically using observing um, to make sure that we even have the same memory about it, because sometimes we don't. Um, he said yes. And I said, I imagine that in that moment, you felt like left out in some way, or you were trying to get me to stop talking, like it felt like a put down. So I'm actually, I'm, I like doing it where I'm questioning first, because a lot of the time we don't have the right information. So if you lead with a receptive language, if you can, when we're under trigger, we're not always able to. So I'm not saying that this is like what you can do all the time. I'm just saying it's when I'm when I'm resourced enough, it's my ideal. And sometimes you want to go for a walk and get yourself in the right headspace before you have these conversations. But I'm trying to lead receptively to allow him to open up in expression. Um, so he said, yeah, that was what was happening. And I felt, he said, I felt um, like oftentimes when we're in situations, you will lead with all the information and then there's very little space for me to come in and offer something. I was like, oh, okay. Like that kind of is true. And I don't want to necessarily be doing that, but I can't like change on the, on a dime. Like if he just said in that moment, could you not do that? I, you know, next time it's just going to happen again. So instead I was like, can we come up with some sort of signal where when I'm doing that, you can direct me to do something else? And so we just negotiated that. We were like, what is the direction that he can give that will help me start to change this behavior? Because I also want to change the behavior. And then I asked him as well, this may be hard, but can you just like try not to use that phrasing? Because I've gotten told that and it shuts me down. Um, and I told him what some of my background with that phrase to help him understand. I was like, here's the story from my childhood um, about getting told that I'm a lot. Because sometimes like experiential stories are context. People need to feel us. They need to like know what that's actually like before they can understand why they should change it um, if they will. So, and it was really helpful because we have, we have the language of relating languages. So oftentimes I can even just say like, hey, I, I don't want you to direct right now. And he knows what that means. So I use this as a shorthand as well. Um, or I was in the car with somebody recently who kept asking me questions. And I was like, hey, actually, I feel pretty inward. I really don't want to storytell right now. 
Um, I'm open to either questioning you or just to observing and watching this awesome scenery. Which would you prefer? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> That's awesome. First of all, thank you for that very clear and real example from your partnership, because we all have examples like that. And it's so helpful to hear how other people put language to relational negotiation. Mm -hmm. I think often what's modeled for us is shut down or project out. And to have a way to hear what it could sound like and to hear the negotiation and the conversation and you know the the callback to the the wound that it touched on is super important i think that's that's a that's a huge part of what creates intimacy and connection and allows us to move forward together with a new agreement about how we want to operate in a certain context so yeah thank you for sharing that for sure and i i want to name one more thing on it too that what you said reminded yeah. me of is like um, so like I said, I've also been doing a lot of working with and studying conflict. Something I've found is like people prefer to fight with different relating languages. Well, like, say more about that. <laughs> well, so that was a moment where my partner and I slowed down. Hmm. But a lot of the time we will just like actually get angry at each other, even in front of a group of students like this, like screws with people's heads because they go, oh, no, mom and dad are fighting. <laughs> I can and see literally that. just storytell and direct at each other um you know and and then it's cleared it's like we will get out the expression we need to sometimes even talking over or past each other and then once the intensity has faded one of us all of a sudden will go so what did you mean <laughs> right or like i'm just upset at you right now like we'll we'll use a receptive thing and and i never knew before him that you could fight you could fight safely in that way. It wasn't until I saw him fighting with, with, with another partner that I, and I watched them that I was like, oh my God, there's actually value in this. And like, some people can just tell each other what to do and be directive towards each other. And then at some point, like one of them just kind of is like, all right, I'll do that thing. Like, it's so fascinating. Wow. Okay. That's brilliant because I, th the impression that I grew up with anyway, is that fighting is dangerous and it never leads to conclusion or resolution or repair. And it's us fighting our own point, trying to be right, trying to one up the other person. So in, do you have an example from when you and your partner fought safely and maybe you were storytelling or directing at each other and like, what did it sound like? Or what was the ultimate resolution where something like popped the bubble and then it was like, oh, what did you mean by that? Um, it like kind of what it, I don't have like a specific example just because it happens a lot, <laughs> but it usually looks something like, Hey, I really don't like it when you do that. Well, you know, you kind of do the same thing a lot of the time. Like you'll oftentimes yell at me as well. Yeah, I know, but it didn't feel really good in this circumstance. So what do you want me to do? I mean, I'd like it if you didn't yell at me as much. Well, it's going to be hard for me to do that because it's like a norm of my culture. I'm like, okay, then what would work for you? Right. It's like in that, in that moment, like one of us is kind of like, just like softens a little bit. Cause one of the things is with him and I, that we kind of get into a lot is this idea of being on the same team. And he is this heuristic or this kind of frame for me, which is when I start getting really against him, he'll just say same team. And I'll be like, damn it, because <laughs> I've forgotten it in that moment. Um, and because both of us, like, we're also, we're, we're, most of our team is on the spectrum and he and I are too. So it's like, we're pretty rational people. And we know that what we want is to get a good outcome with the other person. And so oftentimes there's a moment where in our brain, we go, this doesn't work. We're not going to get the outcome we want. When he and I teach conflict we oftentimes talk about that in any communication, there's a context, a content, and a concern. The content is what we're saying. Um, the concern is what's underneath it. So what do we care about? What is our goal? What matters to us? And in most conflicts, when we're just trading information back and forth, we're not aware of, of what we actually want. Um, so that's that's oftentimes one thing where we'll kind of get this break is like, what do you actually want here? Um, 
or why is this important to you? Like those are two of the best questions for addressing concerns. And the other thing that we'll think about is context, which is like the frame on a situation, like when it's happening, where it's happening, how long it takes, are both people in a safe space, even things that's explicit context, what you can set, but it's also context like power dynamics and gender and systems and race and all of those. So it's like another question that if if we're getting into it, something that actually happened was like during the interview, I started to try to try to process it with him. Like I noticed that it was bugging me. And so I paused the interview and muted myself. And I was like, Hey, you know, that moment didn't feel good to me. And he like, kind of just was like, like looked at me and went, okay. And I had this moment of like, I used, that was not the right language. I just like straight up story told at him. I didn't get curious and it wasn't the right context. This was mm. not, we did not have time to discuss it then. He wasn't in a place where he could be receptive because we were both under time pressure. So I was like, all right, I'm going to lay this aside. I'm going to do it afterwards. And I'm going to first ask if he's open to it. And that context worked way better. So we we don't often think about like, is this going badly just because like I'm doing it in the kitchen when I only have five minutes in front of the kids. <laughs> like that's a dangerous situation. Right. That's wow. That really paints a picture of, of, nuance around this idea of conflict. First, I noticed you said um, something to the effect of when we teach conflict. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I don't know if you meant it this way, but I love that there is an idea of teaching conflict. Like to learn how to have healthy conflict and how to communicate in a healthy way through a conflict. And then, then these components that go along with it Mm -hmm. um, context, content and concerns you said, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which kind of blows my mind because again, a lot of the impression I grew up with was conflict sucks, avoid it at all costs. There is no healthy or good way or good way to do it. Right. And what you're sharing now really, really widens my frame of reference for what's possible. And I, I, I imagine it does for anybody who's listening to this looking at those components where, okay, maybe the timing and the setting isn't right. Maybe the time constraints aren't right. So how can we look at the different components here to create the optimal conditions for what we want? And if what we want is resolution and reconnection and repair, then what's required to create that together? Yeah. Yeah. I felt, I felt a lot of care when you talked about your situation growing up and knowing how many of us grew up in those situations. Like, I think very few people grow up with healthy conflict, um, or with it modeled. I met, I met this uh, woman recently that we were talking about the relating languages and our conflict work too. And she was talking about how she and her husband deliberately fight in front of their kids sometimes in order to show them what healthy conflict can look like, because for a lot of people, it's like they, had their parents go away and shout at each other behind closed doors. Um, or they had their parents like fight violently in front of them without much awareness or their parents never fought, which sometimes can be even worse because you can feel the underlying dynamics. It's really, it's really difficult to, to, I was going to say it's really difficult to do content conflict. Well, that's not necessarily true. It just requires training that I think very few of us get. And if we do get it, the training we get is mostly like set a timer and let one person speak for 20 minutes and only reflect. And then you speak for 20 minutes and they only reflect. And that's not actually how it, that's not actually the best way to do it. Cause then you just hold on to all the upset that you have inside yourself while they're talking. Right. I think I appreciate you sharing that. I would agree with you. We're not widely taught how to conflict healthfully mm -hmm. and it seems to me, and let me know from your experience, that it's such a dynamic process. Like there isn't one set way to do this because in every moment, in every stage in our life, in every phase in our cycle or whatever it is, like we're different. Yeah. And what feels right and good for me now might feel triggering as hell for me in five minutes from now. And then, you know, so there is, what I'm getting is that this requires a deep level of attunement and presence to be with and assess 
the landscape, our internal landscape, the landscape of the relational space, asking our partner questions for what's happening inside of them. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of nuance here. It sounds equally like a science in some ways as it does an art. Absolutely. And that's really why I wanted something like the Relating Languages to exist, because we had all of these tools, but we didn't really have good heuristics or categories to put them in. So in the moment, instead of being like, which of these 80 tools I have in my belt do I use? You could just be like, have I tried each of these four options? And then you can be like, okay, maybe there, there are obviously different ways to do each of those four. They're super reductionist. Um, but you could be like, all right, have, you know, then have I tried other varieties, but at least you have four tools to draw on, but I can't, people are always like a, give me an, if a, then B. And I'm like, I can't, like, it is an art. You have to try it. And it's going to, like you said, it's going to work differently with different people and even at different times. And it's also kind of like the love languages where sometimes you find that you're in conflict and you're having to speak the other person's language. And it's super frustrating and you have to figure out how to negotiate whose language is going to get spoken first and for how long. Um, and that can be hard. There's no way to make it comfortable. <laughs> yeah. I think of those moments as uh, being forged. Mm. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm building some character right here because I'm really just navigating what's happening inside of me right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm just going to hold that. on as long as I can. And you yeah. talked about um, authentic relating at the very beginning. And I have this belief about authenticity that we can be authentic with um, our, our words, our feelings, or our values. And our thoughts are kind of another variant of that. But a lot of us think of authenticity as like, I'm going to be authentic with what I feel. Um, we know our words can change, but we kind of think of our feelings as these static things where I like have to tell my truth about what I'm feeling in these in this moment. But our feelings are really changeable. So if we think of like being true to myself or being authentic as always saying what I feel or always going with what I feel, we can kind of get shifted from one direction to another. And we can also end up in conflicts where we feel like we're being true to ourselves, but actually we're like really hurting the other person or saying something that in another moment we regret, which is why I like existing at this level of values or concerns. So I'm regularly checking in, like, is this in line with what I want for this relationship? Is this in line with who I'm trying to be? It's one reason why I got married to my husband. Cause I was like, this person challenges me constantly, but it feels like all the ways that he's needing to change me are the ways that I want to be changed. Ooh, I just got a chill through my whole body. That's a, a, a beautiful sentiment. All the ways that he's trying to change me, I want to be changed. Mm -hmm. And allowing for the space of partnership and for partners to hold us to our highest potential. And I, I can really appreciate that because I had a lot of, I, I felt very challenged in the first three years of my relationship with my partner where there was very clearly a power dynamic. I put myself in one down, I put him in one up and there were all sorts of dynamics in our communication, lots of storytelling and directing and, you know, feeling the desire now to want to be changed in those ways and to see him as a leader in certain areas of life where I really admire how he carries himself and I allow myself to be in the change process because he's he's a leader in that area feels really lovely. But for a lot of my life, I really resisted that mm. because I thought there was something bad or wrong about somebody trying to change me because there was an internalization that I'm not enough as I am. And so somebody coming in and trying to change really rubbed up against that wound. And so to hear somebody else say that just struck a chord with me. I'm like, wow, like allowing ourselves to be changed and transformed in relationship is such a beautiful part of what relationships can provide. Yeah. And I think it's one that we have to decide if it's what we want and what we want to be open to. Because for some people, it's like their core value or concern is like wanting to feel more steady and stable and accepted. 
And in that case, maybe a relationship that asks them to change a lot is actually going to be really dangerous. But for others, it's like growth is their main concern and seeing things that they don't or truth. And I think for that, you might end up with somebody that's that's like more different from you and more willing to kind of push you in different directions. I think it can just be different, difficult if you don't recognize what you're actually needing and valuing and you end up with someone who's in conflict to it and the pain you're feeling is not uh, not usable. Right, right. Because there's just a values misalignment. Yeah. yeah. What was the shift for you? Okay, so it was a series of events because in the beginning and for the first few years, I did feel a, a, a misalignment in that value set that you had just mentioned. I was really yearning for stability, acceptance. And it's not that he wasn't providing that, but he's very, very, he has a very high value for growth and a very high value around like seeking truth, if you will. And so we had a, a misalignment there for a little while. And there were a series of like blowout arguments where I had just like, it felt like I had exploded. And in one moment, I remember running into the bedroom, shutting the door, slamming it, putting my back against the wall and melting into the ground and thinking, okay, I can leave. He's not holding me here. I can leave. I have free will to do that, but I'm choosing to stay. And I know that even past this moment, I'm choosing to stay, though I want to tell him to fuck off right now. I'm choosing to be here. So what is it, how would I carry myself to be able to navigate what's happening inside of me? I'll say more effectively, but in a way that we can both communicate about it. And that was the first time I had started thinking about what emotional leadership means to me and what it means for me to lead myself through my different emotional states and be able to come back to radical personal responsibility about how I personally feel and the stories that I may be making or the interpretations that I may be making, the needs that are going unmet, the requests that I have, maybe the boundaries that got crossed. And what I want to take responsibility and accountability for, and if I, you know, whatever part I have in this, what I'd like to do differently next time, even if that's taking five minutes away. And so that inquiry happened progressively over time because I saw that the finger pointing and the blaming that I was in the habit of doing, which is what I saw growing up, was not getting me to where I wanted to go. It wasn't getting us to deeper connection, mutual understanding, intimacy. It really had him put up his defenses. And I'm like, this, yeah, sure. It, it I'm going to use a very uh, explicit term. Yeah, it feels good to like blow my load of anger and just like bleh, project it out. Mm -hmm. But truly it's not bringing us to what I desire for us, which is connection. So if, if that's not happening, then what can I look at and take radical responsibility for and still, you know, be a space where he holds himself accountable so that we can actually have that. And it, it has taken a lot of practice and still I practice every single day. <laughs> and so that was, you know, it was just a series of, it got so intense at one point and there was no resolution or repair for a long enough amount of time that I'm like, all right, we're either going to do this or we're not you know, we're, we're going to say no and we're going to dissolve the relationship or for lack of a more elegant way to say it, we're going to get our shit together and we're going to decide that we want to do this differently. So what's it going to be? And I, I show up to myself like that often with a lot of love and compassion, but it's, it is sort of, you know, once I've done the emotional processing, it's the shit or get off the pot because I, I suffer in indecision and I thrive when I, can arrive at a place of clarity after processing where I'm like, all right, this is who I'm going to be. This is how I'm going to show up. And I will do everything in my power to act in alignment with this value. And so it's been progressive, but that's how I've thought about it. I love that. Hmm. I can like feel from personal experience how much of an everyday choice that is. 
and how much easier it is to just like go with the norm. It, it has me think of like what this distinction between like hedonism, like in the moment happiness and what the Greeks used to call eudaimonia, which is like fulfillment overall. And it's like a, a much slower burn and doesn't feel as fulfilling as, as like the blowing your top off, but it's, it, I think brings us closer to who we want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you for receiving that. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I want to honor your time. I know we had a few other things planned for this conversation. Do you have a hard stop in four minutes? No, I can stop around 10 after. Okay, cool. Because I wanted to go through and just something we had talked about in getting ready for this episode was workshopping an example on the podcast. And I'm so curious cool. to surrender to whatever this process is and let it hit the airwaves. Let's try it. Um, I feel terrified. And we'll see. Okay. If it works. Great. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, tell me about a moment that you're struggling with or a dynamic, but ideally okay. like a, a moment that you can pull from where it happened. Yeah. So this was yesterday. I was sitting here at the very table I'm at in a group program session. So I had 80 women on my screen. I wasn't facilitating, but I was receiving. And uh, my partner's over here in the kitchen. He noticed that the bag of arugula from the farmer's market is still in, or it, the arugula is still in the plastic bag. We have a pretty high value around not letting things sit in plastic where the chemicals leach into the food. And in the middle of my being in my session, he looks at me and he goes, why did you leave the arugula in the plastic with a particular tone? Mm -hmm. And immediately my defenses came up. I muted my mic and I said, you know what? You've walked by it a million times. You could have taken the arugula out and put it in a bowl. Why are you blaming me? And then this just set both of us into place. It triggered both of us in some very specific ways. Me thinking that I fucked up, I'm wrong, I'm bad, childhood stuff. Him, the trigger for him was um, someone not taking responsibility or accountability for something that they agreed to, which is his childhood stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was the the context. That was the what happened. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and let me know if you have, if I need to provide more. Well, it sounds like, did you guys explore what came up underneath it later? Or was it like, you just know that about him and about yourself? We explored what came up, up later. And this has been a, this is one of the the patterns where like, the- Go on. Yeah. This is just one of the loops that we have found ourselves in much less often these days. Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely progressed, but this has been one of the more painful- conflict loops that we found ourselves in because of stuff that we experienced in childhood is the loop like this specific like you know you didn't do something that you were supposed to or is the loop like you know you didn't do it and you could have you could have come in and done it or is it just that like he gets upset and then you get mad in response like what is the specific so without him being here and saying what's true for him this is my interpretation is he perceives something that creates an experience inside of him. We can call it anger, frustration, confusion. And then will share that with me in a way that I perceive as blame. Mm -hmm. That perception then has me put my defenses up. I get defensive and I'm like, either fuck off energetically and, you know, either don't take full ownership of it in the moment or volley it back and say, well, you could have done this or you don't, you also don't do this. Yeah. And so there's not a responsibility in the moment. I volley it back. This triggers him. And mm -hmm. he's like, oh, well now I'm, I feel completely invalidated. He digs his heels in the ground more. And then it comes back to me. Yeah. And it used to be collapse. Sometimes it's also like, you want to, you want to fucking get big? Watch me get big. Yeah. I feel like the tension rising in my body while you're talking about it. I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's the fire starting right there. Um, 
the first thing I would say is like, is to find a pattern interrupt. Like mm-hmm. when we're in that back and forth very quick, it's like, it kind of doesn't matter what language you use. It doesn't matter why you're upset, what the, what the concern is, whatever, like you need a context shift. Um, and people do that in different ways. Like, uh, sometimes I'll do it by just like staring at my partner until he realizes something has happened. (laughs) Um, sometimes we'll have like a hand signal or a phrase or something. My parents used to, when they were in a fight, just be like, let's just stop. And that was literally their phrase to stop. Um, do you have, or, or it can be like, you know, I'm going to, uh, do box breathing, which is like, take a breath in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, breathe out for four, hold it for four. Do you have any sort of pattern interrupt that works for you? Breathing can definitely work. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'll say, you know what, I need a minute and I'll step away. And that'll just mm-hmm. sort of break the tension a bit. Sometimes when things get really heated and we're doing the storytelling, directing at each other, one of us will just start laughing because it's it almost appears as so ridiculous in the moment. Like the tension is so high that it breaks and we start laughing. And then when one person laughs, the other person laughs. Um, mm-hmm. That's not something we plan. So that's another one. I'd say those are the those are the main ones. And or I will have a coming back to consciousness where I'm like, okay, I know that what works in these moments is when I soften. And sometimes I, you know, as I've gotten better at uh, emotional navigation and regulation, I realize that I can be the emotional leader in that context. And I can say, okay, one of us is going to have to go first, like you said before. If I soften and I choose to remain soft and open while still having healthy boundaries, then I trust that I can navigate us through this. And sometimes it'll just be a imagining like my, the, the wall around my heart softening and like surrendering into it and making that choice. And again, I can do that when I'm resourced. Love that. Yeah. Those are, those are beautiful examples. Yeah. It's kind of like in that, unless you have a built-in pattern interrupt in that moment, you might not be able to stop the trigger from happening. It's like, what do you do? It's kind of like three pieces, right? It's like, what do you do in the moment that it happens? What do you do once you wake up a little bit to the fact that it is happening, maybe halfway through the argument? And then what do you do later on when you're not triggered to set the stage for things to go better next time? Um, So one of the setting the stage things can be to like come up with a pattern interrupt that you can practice even, um, which I like fast ones, like a hand up, or like a breath or, cause sometimes you don't even have the wherewithal to be like, I'm going to take a moment. It's like, right, right. I don't have five words to spare, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, it can also be hard because sometimes pattern interrupts can like trigger, trigger patterns in themselves. Like I'm going to stand up and walk away and then you're triggered by abandonment. We have to process that later. So changes person to person. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it sounds like that maybe that's one, but then it sounds like you're actually doing really well once you get into the conflict um and i would say like being able to have one moment where you can go into observing Mm -hmm. if you can um even if it creates an awkward silence uh sometimes just changing the pace of the conversation can really be helpful if one of you can do that because then the other person will oftentimes start sharing a little more about their motivation You don't even Mm -hmm. need to get so far as questioning, which I feel like for a lot of people, unless questioning is their stress language takes like a good amount of openness or curiosity just goes away when we're triggered. Um, Sometimes people will ask questions that are like trying to figure out where they're safe. Like, what did you mean by that? And like, do you actually want me to be that way? Like that's kind of a stress questioning, but to find curiosity, usually we have to create enough space. Um. So that would be one thing. And it feels like you're already kind of exploring his concerns. So the only other thing I'd say is like to when you have a moment when you're not in it to talk about like, hey, I noticed this moment came up the other day. What happened for you? What happened for me? Cool. When that comes up again, like how do you want to navigate it? Like say I leave arugula in the plastic, like what do you, what do you want to do? Like, how can you respond that would work for me? What can I do? Um, and I like to use a tool called Murphy Jitsu. 
Hmm. And that, which is like kind of jujitsu around Murphy's law, which is you think about, you, you kind of, all right, let's direct towards a solution. Cool. Like you're going to do this. I'm going to do this. We've agreed on it. And then you go, okay, it's a week in the future. This thing has happened again. What is the likelihood that we actually did the thing? Mm. And if you're like, I can't actually imagine myself doing that, you need to go back and renegotiate. Love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's like creating a fail safe. Like what are all the places where we wouldn't do the thing that we just said we were going to do? And what would actually make it easier for us to navigate this concern meaningfully? Yeah. Is that solution or do we have to kind of negotiate a different one? And the one thing that you want to try to keep away from in that sort of clearing conversation is like, even in mediation, when two people, one of the first steps of mediation is each person tells the story of what happened. And then the mediator's job is not to make those stories align. It's just to find out why that thing happened to get to the concerns underneath it. So like, if you get to a moment where you're like, I say this happened and you say this happened and we're getting like caught up on that detail. If you can just drop it because it's not actually what's most important in the conversation and it'll go on kind of forever. Yeah. Yeah. If you can like, that's, that's a just stop it moment. Like, or why did that moment matter to you? Go into questioning a little bit um, or story tell about why that moment mattered to you instead of trying to get shared reality on what happened. Love that. I feel like that's like an, an excellent pro tip and the Murphy Jitsu also very yeah. fun. So thank you. Thank you for all of that, that feedback and perspective. I, I have so many morsels to take with me now to try on in the dojo of my life. Are there any that you feel like, huh, this could actually be useful? Um, definitely that, that the sort of retrospective approach where it's like, hey, now that we're out of the triggered moment in looking back, what would, how would you have, liked that I responded? What would have felt better for you? Okay. Here's what would have felt better for me and having a a conversation so that we can build internal, an internal map about how to navigate something like that in the future has been super helpful. And I think will continue to be helpful. I love the stress testing it though with Murphy Jitsu, which is okay. Do we in good faith think that that's how we'll show up next time this happens? Mm -hmm. And you know, if not, what would keep us from that? And do we need to you know, really uh, consider that, that, that thing, whatever that thing is that would keep us from keeping our word to this. So that feels really helpful. And then understanding what someone's underlying motivation, desire, or concern is really gets to the heart of it. Instead of harping on a detail of you said this, or you did that, which memory fails us often, and we all have our own interpretations of how things happened. So getting to the heart, the emotion, the desire, the human need underneath the detail feels like we're just getting to the root faster and we don't have to argue about, you know, details that may or may not be true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, I want to give give credit too, because I forgot to do this. The Murphy Jitsu technique is from the Center for Applied Rationality. I like kind of making sure that people know where things come from. I love that. The Center for Applied Rationality. Amazing. Cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So I know we didn't get to everything today, but I want to thank you so much for the personal stories that you've shared, the wisdom that you've shared, and just supporting me in my process. I have i don't think I've ever done that on a podcast episode before. So this is really new and fun. And for those who want to reach out to you, connect, learn more about the work, what's the best way to learn more about the Relating Languages? Yeah. So Relating Languages, you can go to the site relatinglanguages.com and you'll find there's a little five minute quiz that you can take that'll help you understand what your primary relating language um, is. And then there's a longer quiz as well that's like small payment and that will kind of get way more in depth about what language you use in social situations and it'll give you a whole readout of how to develop your skills in that. And there are some manuals on that site. So that's a really cool resource for the languages. Oh man, I'm gonna yell him about yell at him about that later. <laughs> um, and then for some of the other work that I do, you can go to AuthRev, short for Authentic Revolution, AuthRev.org, and that has some stuff on the Art of Difficult Conversations class that my husband and I teach, where we talk about a lot of our conflict skills and some leadership trainings 
um, and different authentic relating manuals. I love that. A-U-T-H-R-E-V. Yep. Dot and relating.org and relatinglanguages.com. And I think Amazing. if you go to the .org by, or the .com of either of them, it'll just redirect you. Perfect. And I know you're leading a retreat soon. So you you all do host in-person events for this work. Yeah, we have a Relating Languages retreat coming up this weekend. So if you know, if you're in Northern California, feel free to join us. Um, but I think it'll be after when this podcast publishes. But we're doing a facilitation training um, in person uh, in mid-September in Austin and then online uh, in um, starting in o- mid-October, October 12th. And the online one will include some of the Relating Languages materials and then we'll be developing more processes for that, especially, I think, starting to lead some fight labs, which we didn't get to talk about, but that's like, you know, kind of like what we did, except we would role play the conflict and we'd actually have like somebody play you and somebody play your partner, or you could be one of them. And then we'd have you have the fight play out and then we'd workshop the conflict and have some tools to play with. So Uh, we're trying to find ways to make this really experiential. That's so fun. That's like the, the linguistic version of sock and boppers. I don't know if you grew up. (laughs) Yeah. Just totally. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my God. That's awesome. Thank you so much for doing the work that you do in the world and helping people relate to themselves and each other more authentically and, you know, with heart at the center. Thanks Lee. And thank you for what you do as well. Mm. I can already tell that it helps a lot of people and it's beautifully crafted. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. For everyone listening, you have all of Ari's contact information. Definitely check out their work. Thank you for tuning in and I'm sending you all so much love and good vibes. Thank you, everybody.